What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Seven Figure Flipping Podcast. This is Bill Allen. On today's show, I've got one of the Flip Hacking Live 2023 speakers who's coming in and talking about his presentation, some of the takeaways, uh, some of the feedback he got, and some ways that he, like what he got from the event as well. So I hope you guys enjoy this. It's about, uh, he was on the show recently, just a couple months ago, and he talked about high-end luxury flips. And today he's giving his bullet points of what he talked about at the event, some things to think about when you're um, when you're considering doing something like this, and then also some of the takeaway and feedback. And we talk ab about decision making and, and creative thinking and stuff like that, like cognitive thinking. It's a really interesting show. I hope you guys enjoy it. And in the end, I give you an opportunity to come in and, and see it and, and experience Flip Hacking Live again on a live replay. We're going to talk about it during the uh, show today. So I hope you enjoy my name is Bill Allen, and I'm the leader of a group of elite house flippers and wholesalers called Seven Figure Flipping. We don't brag or show off our success, but instead let integrity and stewardship be our guide. We are dedicated to helping people unlock the freedom they desperately need. If you ask other real estate investors, they will say to keep your secrets quiet. But we believe in abundance, not scarcity. And that's why we are the elite. We are Seven Figure Flipping, and this podcast is our playbook. What is up, everybody? I have an awesome podcast for you guys today. I'm really excited about my guest. He was actually just on the show just a couple months ago. You may not, you may have heard it, and if you missed it and you didn't hear him, um, go back and listen to uh, the previous show where he talks a little bit about his background, his history, story, things like that. So the last show that we did, we talked about um, luxury, like flipping more luxury houses, more expensive houses. And Nathan came in on and talked about some of his process and system. And then it was just a regular show. And at the end, I was like, man, I think people would love to hear about this exact strategy at Flip Hacking Live. So I asked you guys to email me and, and comment on the, on the podcast, on social media. And so many of you did that in my head, I said, I got to get Nathan to come speak at Flip Hacking Live. So as I was building out the plan, he's, he's in my head. I'm planning on having him speak. But I, um, I didn't actually like call him or ask him or communicate that to any of my team or staff or anything. And so when they did the speaker calls, I didn't see him on there. And then we went all the way up to the event and I was like, wait, like, where is Nathan? Why is he not on the plan? Like, why is he, why doesn't he have a presentation? Like, why hasn't anybody talked to him? And I think we were actually in San Diego when we sat down at the hotel when I was like, hey, I want you to speak at this event. I don't know why no one told you and by no one, I mean me and why I didn't tell anyone. And you were like, yeah, I'll do it for sure. I think that's how it went down. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, I think at like 1030 at night in the, in the hotel bar, you were like, I didn't see you on the call sheet. And I was like, yeah, nobody's reached out. And you're like, can you do it on Friday? Sure. And then I put it together on Thursday. I was already working on it anyway. So I, I took the finishing touches on it on Thursday and then went up there on Friday. So it was awesome. Yeah. 100% my fault absolutely my fault. I, it's just like so much going on, planning, promoting, all that stuff. But he gave an amazing presentation. So um, it was absolutely incredible. And what I wanted to do is invite him to come back on the show and kind of talk about some of the things that he, that he shared at FHL so you guys could hear it and you could implement it. And then maybe some of the feedback that he got and some other people that are um, that are implementing exactly his strategy. So Nathan, if they don't want to go back and listen to the previous show, if you can just give like the Cliff Notes version of who you are and what you're doing right now and, and why you think it's important for them, I think that would help. Yeah, so the Cliff Notes real quick version um, is I do mostly high-end and luxury flips in South Texas. Um, it's a niche that I think when I talk to people about it, I say the reason I got into it is I didn't want to fight my personality. So if there's people out there, the main takeaway of it is if you can't fight your personality, you're used to doing high-end stuff, it's what your background is in. My father was a general contractor working in multi-million dollar homes. Um, I was fighting my own tendencies for the longest time. If you feel like that's you, don't fight it. Just switch the niche that you work in. So for me, that was higher end. Now I don't have to fight it. Now I don't have to worry about going over budget. Now I don't have to worry about having too nice of fixtures, too nice of finishes. And so it lends itself really, really well. So that was kind of point number one is don't fight your natural tendencies. Um, and then number two is how to track it down in your market. Um, and what we're looking for is we're not looking for First time home buyers, we're not looking for second time home buyers, but that's close. But what we're looking for is people with massive equity in their home that when they sell, they're going to roll that into their next home. Um, we're looking for high income earners. That was the, the number two takeaway from the event was high income earners. We're talking about doctors, lawyers. And when I say high income, I'm not talking just six figures. I'm talking they're making $350,000, $500,000 million a year, but they're employees. They're not 
uh, you know, self-employed, they're not business owners, they go work 60 hours a week to make their high income because they don't have time to do it themselves. If we go above that and we're finding people who are wealthy or have family money, um, they're tending to build custom homes. That's not our audience. So that was the number two thing. And then the third thing um, is just narrowing down your buy box because a lot of these wholesalers where you're finding your deals um, and foreclosure stuff, it's, they're not really bringing it to you because that's not their bread and butter. That's not what 90% of investors do. And so it's letting those people know, this is my specific buy box. We're finding very niche down markets for us in, in San Antonio. We're looking for areas where it's a really desirable school district and there's nowhere for it to expand. It's called Alamo Heights here. I really, really target areas like that. So it's really niching down saying in my market, it's got to be 750,000 to $1.2 million ARV. I've got to be in the Alamo Heights school district. Um, and it's a place where there's no expansion. So it's creating limited inventory. That's kind of the gist of what I talked about um, at Flip Hacking Live. And that way, I still suggest you go back because I go into really, really detail about it. And I kind of show you where to find the information. But for anybody that wasn't there, that that's kind of the easiest summation of what I talked about. Yeah, I really like that. Because what I, what I noticed is, number one, you know, your, um, you know, your area so well of what you're looking for. So your supply, you know, the supply of those types of houses, and you can be very specific. And typically, you're like a buyer of one. So there might not be a lot of other flippers that are working in that world. Mm -hmm. And you know it really well. It's your background. So I always say this, like, um, like, especially my book, it's like, do people come to me all the time? Do you want to be a wholesaler? Or do I want to be a, should I be a flipper? It's like, well, what, what do you lend the best to? Same with your marketing channels, like design your marketing channels such that it, it plays your strength. So I think I love that you do that. And then the other piece is, you know, your buyer, like your, your, the demand, your actual backend buyer really well, what they want, what they're looking for, who they are, um, what some of their problems are, issues, the demographics, psychographics of that buyer um, really well. So now you know what kind of product in the marketplace. And then as anything changes or shifts in the market, you can determine how that's affecting that actual buyer that you know, not just hoping that eventually this will sell. And you can kind of shift and pivot and change along the way. So, uh, and, and really strong opinions. I love that too. Like you had a really strong opinion of how you do and, and why you do what you do. So I think, I think that opinion comes with experience. So if you're, if you're listening and watching, I think you got somebody who is really opinionated, who says, I do this because dot, dot, dot. And they will like argue back and forth with somebody else who does something differently. It's usually based on experience and like that their experience box growing and growing. And so they, they know they've been successful. They know why, and they know they, they believe in what they do. So I think all of those things are really cool that I saw at the event. What were some of the, um, some of the feedback that you got from the presentation at the event? Like, I'm sure like after you speak at an event like that, people come up to you all the time, see you in the hallway. Um, you know, what was, what were some of them saying? And, and, and have you seen anybody or heard of anybody or has anybody followed up with you that they're actually like taking action on some of the stuff that you talked about? Yeah, absolutely. So right afterward, absolutely you get bombarded. So once you come off and then you take any sort of a break, I probably had five or six people immediately come up to me. And then throughout the weekend, probably five or six every single day after that. Um, the main feedback from those people that came to, to approach me was, this is exactly what I've been thinking, but nobody teaches that. Everybody says to do the, the starter homes, the, the median price range stuff. But my mind, I kept thinking if I do high end, I, there's bigger spreads, there's less risk. And I went, yeah, your brain is wired the same way as mine. It doesn't mean we're right. It doesn't mean we're wrong. It does, there's, there's so many different ways to make money in this business. It just lends itself to don't fight your natural tendencies. So when those people, it resonated with them because they went, man, I've already been thinking this. This is already where my mind has been going. But every book and every guru and every Instagram post I see says to do the opposite. It was really refreshing to hear you say that's exactly what you do. Um, and so that was awesome. And then I've definitely had three or four people follow up since that are still in regular contact asking me, hey, do you have design boards that you could share with me? 100%. And I immediately text that over or I email that to them. So I think it's kind of nice for them because they've got somebody supporting them as well, which is I mentioned that on the podcast before, you know, I said, Hey, here's my phone number. If you want to get a hold of me, I'm an open book and I'll help you. And, and so I have done that with about three different people. Um, and then there's two inside the group that were like, Hey, this is kind of what I do, but I'm just branching into it. And our group is awesome. Anyway, we all support each other. So they've been really, really communicative, but there's been three people outside of our group that were just attendants that keep in regular contact with me and follow up. There's always going to be people that, yeah, they say hi and they want to get into it. And then I haven't heard from them since, but there's three of them that, yeah, they, they just were there for the event and they follow up with me all the time. And they ask my opinion. The one thing I won't help them with is ARV stuff like that, because you got to put the work in. I'm never going to help somebody do that. If you don't do the reps, um, which I know you talked about that too, with the simulation. So if you don't get the reps in ahead of time, 
you're not going to be able to do it. So I'm not going to do the work for them, but I am there once they've, you know, taken that leap and taken that first step. I'm the first person that's going to help you. If you say, I nailed down this ARV, I know my buyer pool, I'll walk them through, you know, the price range. I'll help them with that because that is very nuanced and that's where you can, you can mess up and lose a a lot of money. So I'll help them with the range they're looking for, but I won't help them with the ARV side. Yeah, I agree with you. A lot of that stuff is, it's like the don't touch the stove thing. Like, don't touch the stove. I tell somebody not to touch the stove. And you tell them a story about what happened when you touch the stove and you burn your hand. And sometimes they, they just have to touch the stove. So the whole goal is how do we make it in a safe enough environment for them where they don't really burn themselves in a horrible way and, and, and they get there in a lower risk situation like you're talking about in let me help you with some of these things. But if, effectively, you have to make some decisions. Like you have to take steps. You actually have to skin your knee a little bit to learn. And like... You mentioned the simulation. I really do think that there's, we talked about it at Flip Hacking Live. I've talked about it on the show a lot recently. We've got a lot of problem with like rote memorization and training and coaching and like watch these videos uh, and then ask some questions, go on a a limited Q&A or ask me anything. I'll tell you stories about what, and tell you what to do and what you should and shouldn't do. Tell you stories about people who have done it before, who have lost money or have made these mistakes. And then it's like, okay, throw them out there to the wolf. See you later. But in a scenario-based training or simulation type model, if we add that in, now you can take it a step further in a place where you don't have a lot of risk and you can make those decisions in a risk-free or low-risk environment and then feel comfortable getting out there. But once you get out there, like you're talking about, you actually have to skin your knee. Like, Mm -hmm. hopefully you don't break your leg or like lose a ton of money, but there's going to be times where you're going to make a mistake. Like you have to make a mistake to learn. And the more... The, the faster we can get you out in the field, the better. So what I see is those three people or so that have been following up that you're sending design boards. Like those things are in like the step two of the four steps that I see of like, ask me something, ask me anything. And then um, they're starting to like run scenarios through their heads of these properties and like, oh, okay, now I have some new information. I have some stuff. This is going to save me money. This is going to save me time. I feel more comfortable and confident that if I get into a problem, Nathan is messaging me back and forth. Like I actually have kind of a lifeline along the way. So now you're pushing them to get out there and try this faster than they would if they hadn't had that kind of access. And so I think that's a little bit of like the model that I'm trying to build here, but but to actually get them in and make decisions. Like if you were like ran them through like 20 different projects uh, that you had done before that didn't go right or a project that didn't go right and they got the ARV wrong, they could see what the result of that is and why it's so important to put so much time into making sure that that ARV is right. And then they go out and skin their knee. And hopefully their ARV is, is, it's not going to be perfect potentially the first time, but is a lot closer than it would be if they hadn't. So, um, I don't know. What do you think about that? Like, yeah. do you think yeah, sometimes think, we just need like yeah, kicked out the door and like get to take action and figure out a way to get past that resistance? Yeah. One of the, one of the things that we hear all the time in real estate that I'm not a fan of and why I think the simulation kind of solves this is we always say, you know, fail and fail fast. Well, the whole reason that we're afraid is we're afraid to fail. So if you tell somebody get comfortable with failing, but they've never failed, how are they going to get comfortable with failing? And so it's people like us, we've been doing it. We're, we're confident in ourselves that we know we can pivot. We know, there's going to be an issue that's going to happen. It's our critical thinking set or set that gets us through that. It's the experience and the reps that get us through that. Not one of my projects goes without a hitch. Not one. There's always some issue. There's always some unforeseen thing, but it's always phrased in this term of failure. And I think with a simulation, it likens it to a game. You know, like you learn a lot playing Oregon Trail when you're a kid. You've got all these different options. You see which way you can go. One time you die, the other time you don't. And then you learn, okay, don't do that one. Don't go left, go right. Um, and so that's what I think the simulation is going to do is it's going to get people comfortable with saying not everything's going to go right. But I think there's just a huge mistake in real estate that we always say you can't have a fear of failure and fail often. That's a cliche thing that we say when we have the confidence to know we know what decisions to make. But for people who are just getting in, it's too high of a bar to ask of those kinds of people. And so I liken it to the game. The more reps you can get in a game when you when you're playing World of Warcraft or whatever, and you get in there and you fail and you do it again, and then you fail and you do it again and you fail and you keep getting to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. That's what I think the simulation is going to do. And so I think that's, that's paramount for this. And so once you've got the reps under your belt, knowing something's going to go wrong, when I open up a wall, I'm like, okay, this one's not going to be load bearing. 
Sure enough, it is load bearing. Well, now what do I do? It doesn't mean that I can't take that wall out. Now it just goes, now I have to call my engineer. My engineer is going to come out there, design something that's structurally sound, and now I can still do it. It's just going to take a little bit of an extra step. Those are the things where for us, that's a failure. We opened a wall and we thought it was load or thought it wasn't load bearing and it was. Those are the failures that we're talking about. So I don't want people to be so scared of that going into it. When we're talking fail and fail off and we're not saying monumental, massive failures, losing $200,000, do that four times and you'll be great. Do that four times and you're going to be bankrupt. <laughs> you know, so it's like, it's not like you're, they're these high, high risk things that we're doing. We're trying to mitigate risk, knowing that we're going to have small failures. And so that's why I don't like that term. I much prefer the simulation of gaining reps. Yeah, I love that. You, you mentioned the, the term risk and it really is just kind of bang, uh, weighing benefit and cost. So um, there's a saying in the military in our operational risk management principles. So we use this term called ORM, operational risk management. And um, it, we only make risk decisions when the benefits greatly outweigh the costs. So I'm constantly, what I realize is in, inside my head, I'm just constantly weighing the benefit and cost. So just like you said, well, it, going into that, into opening up that wall, I would say, okay, what are the chances it's load bearing? Uh, I think it's low. I, I don't think this is a load bearing wall. Um, what's it going to cost me to, if it is load bearing, what's the plan? If it's not, what's the plan? What's the cost? What's the timeline? What's it going to change? And what's, what do I think? And a hypothesis is just an educated guess. What is my educated guess of a desire of, of the outcome that I'm going to see? And then, okay, I'm willing to take the risk to open it up. And it might be cost me a little bit more money to, and I have like two or three plans. You're playing chess. Like you're three steps ahead instead of just playing checkers. And so I, that, that's the difference. And, and I went back and I thought about my start in real estate and I thought I started really fast and it's always been portrayed that way. Like Justin always portrayed it that way. And even I did. When I look back, I mean, I was reading books and getting information for years, really before I even took the leap. I was, I was like weighing it and weighing the time and whether I should or I shouldn't or because I, I, was, I was investing in the stock market a ton. I was in all these index funds. And I had all my money in these index funds where I was like, okay, if I, if I grow at like 8%, I'll be a millionaire by the time I'm 65 and I was saving a ton of money. And inside those forums, like I was in those forums learning, everybody was bad-mouthing real estate. These are just, everybody's like, <laughs> oh, real estate's so risky and all this stuff. And I started having to ask myself, is that true? Is it not true? And then there was one person in there that kind of talked about real estate and I had a, rent, I had a couple rentals at the time. And we started talking and I was like, man, I'm just going to try this. And it really took like, a lot of iterations in my head for probably like a year or more before I took that first leap to go to that first RIA meeting that was free or buy or, or like go to the library and get that book or let's start listening to these podcasts. And so I was kind of stuck in that loop too, even with the decision-making process that I have. So now my goal is to figure out how I can move people, not, not just not push them or kick them, but actually kind of like encourage them through repetition to figure out how to reduce the wall of risk, like not see risk and, and to be able to do something in a risk free environment, like totally risk free. And I think what that's going to do, is going to sell accelerate a lot of people's timeline. I, I, I believe that what we do in seven figure flipping and the runway and altitude program and accelerates timelines. But most of those people are the ones that have already accepted the fact that they're going to go like they're already ready to jump. And there's a whole bunch of people standing there going, I, I don't even, I can't, I'm not even ready to jump yet. So that, I think that third step in that simulation is for those people to say, hey, there's a net here. Like there's a net, like just jump into the net and take the first step. And now it's easier to jump um, when you really have to and get into the real thing. So that's my plan, at least. I, I, don't, I don't know if we talked about like your start, if there was a lot of that or if you were just like jump right in. But when I, I thought I was jump right in, but when I really thought about it, like, there was a long time of me just kind of like checking it out, like standing on the outskirts looking in. Yeah, I, I was pretty quick to go. I just have a really high risk tolerance. Um, and whether it's accurate or not, I have a, an extreme belief in myself, um, not to the point of arrogance or anything. I know that I can always make mistakes and there's always stuff to learn. I, I know 100%. I don't know everything. I don't know half of what there is to know about construction. Um, but I, I'm confident enough in my ability to pivot, to be able to learn and to know that I can lean on other people with resources. So for me, the, the biggest fear that I had in real estate was honestly switching to full time. So I didn't really have yeah. any issue getting into flipping. I went, well, whatever, I have a job. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen? I, I don't make money or I lose money. I'll make it back in three months at my W2 job. So I jumped right into real estate, jumped right into flipping. Um, I, I don't know if it was too soon, but I really, you know, 
took to heart the, the analysis paralysis and not wanting to get caught into it. So I just went, I'm just going to jump. I'm going to go. And I know that I might not make money, but that's kind of the worst outcome. <laughs> the worst outcome was you're not going to make money. I wasn't afraid that I'm going to, you know, light a house on fire or a wall is going to come crumbling down. I, I'm not, you know, dumb enough to take those kinds of risks, like you were saying earlier, of risk assessment. So I knew that I could jump into it. But for me, it was the hardest part was going to doing it full time. And for me, it was kind of COVID that did it. I, I quit my job, went to do real estate full time. Um, and then got a call from a hotel again, promising me, you know, more than the last hotel job that I had, you know, making six figures. And I went, that comfort is nice. And so it was COVID that pulled the rug out from under me and forced me to do it. And then I, you know, basically forex that next year, my income, once I had no other choice, but to go full-time in real estate. And I know I, I harbored on it before in the last podcast, but I always am a proponent of that. If you put 40 or 60 hours a week, if you're a salaried employee putting 60 hours a week into your job and you put 60 hours into real estate, you can't really lose, you know, and, and I know everybody's got their differing opinion on it, but I stick true to that or I hold true to that is if you're putting four hours a week, yeah, you're not going to good in, 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 you know, relation to the simulation, you're just not getting enough reps in. So even if you don't want to do it, well, cool, set aside 10 hours a week to, to simulate these opportunities and then you're going to be good. You're, you're going to have the confidence to do it. It's just two hours a week, three hours a week. How are you going to build a business doing that? How are you going to build a side hustle that can become a business? I just don't think it's true. Um, I'm much more of just jump in with both feet knowing, and you mentioned this before too. It's like knowing you can always go back to your job. That's the worst case, worst case scenario. You, you aren't good enough at it to do it yet. You have to go back to your job and then apply what you learn and then try it again in another time. So. Yep. I agree with that. And I think our, our risk tolerance definitely like grows and grows and grows as, as we go. So we, we become more and more and more confident. Like when I think that I'm pretty risk tolerant, but when I look back, it's like when something's new, it's, it's unknown and you don't really know how to weigh the benefit and the, and the cost and stuff like that. So you have to get some experience. You have to go in. And so um, my whole goal is that we're building something that we can just help you, like just, just kind of give you a little nudge and push you a little bit faster and, and frankly, a lot faster in some areas. Um, and, and for the people that are running too fast, a lot of times it's like slowing them down a little bit too. Like when you, you get in the simulator, it's like, oh, hey, I actually don't know enough to get out, to get out there and make these decisions. And so understanding the risk, like, cause I can put you in a trap. Like you, you mentioned Oregon trail. It's funny. I remember playing that when I was uh, young and then War, world of Warcraft and all that stuff. It's like, I can actually make it really, uh, I can build a scenario for you. If I think you're too aggressive where I can actually show you some gaps in knowledge and understanding. And then the next step is, okay, let me just build that back up and get back out there. And it really is just like any, any high performing coach, um, and high performing athletes, like they're doing the same thing. They are getting the repetitions in in practice. Like they play what 16 games a year in, in the NFL and then the playoffs, but they're doing, they're practicing, they're doing training, they're on the off season, they're working out. Like nobody is training in real estate. They're just going out there and doing. And so what if we can, we're building basically a training plan for you, like real training, like we did in the military, like we do like doctors, lawyers, uh, nurses, police officers, firefighters do before they go out there in the high risk environment. So, and it's yeah, not, if there's, it's not if there's anything that you've program. said so far, I, I can't harp on what you just said enough. I think that is to me, the number one application for this is it's very easy to do your first flip. One of my buddies did this, did his very first flip. He made like 32 grand on his first flip, whereas I lost $4,800 on my first flip. He made 32 grand and then just started buying, buying, buying. And I was like, man, you don't have the experience yet. So I think the simulator is huge for that. For somebody like me, all of a sudden, I've got access to all this Kiabi money at 100% LTC. And now I've got four projects right now. I learned very quickly. As good as I am at this, I am not good enough to do four at a time. And I'm learning that the hard way by paying about $11,000 a month in carrying costs that it's just going out the window on one of those properties. I found that I can do three at a time. Had I gone through this and you know, you're sitting there going, oh, Nathan, you think you can do four? You think you can do five? Jump into the simulator, try to manage five at a time. And I would have realized very quickly, my tolerance is three at a time. I now know that. And it cost me probably $25,000 to learn that lesson. Not that I lost the money, I'll still make money on each of these houses, but it's 25 grand that if I would have been more efficient and would have known that about myself, that my multitasking stops at three projects at a time but I learned it the hard way and I, I could have learned that with that. So I think it's huge what you just said. I think it's something overlooked, especially at Flip Hacking Live is there's a lot of us in the room that were experienced going, oh, this is really good for the new people. No, I think you just nailed it. Like I, it's good yeah. for everybody. I think it's, it's scary. Like, you know, this, you're a pilot. They say that, and I'm almost done with my PPL now, but it's like 500 hour pilots are the most dangerous pilots in the world. And nobody thinks that they think it's the guy with under 40 hours. Nope. 
every study has shown pilots with 500 hours kill people because they're overconfident. They think that they know everything and all of a sudden they're in a steep bank and then they stall and they spin and they hit the ground. I mean, it's been proven over and over again. So I think this is huge. You're, you're exactly right. We, we, we do, we do operational risk management assessments before every flight in the military. It's the, the early pilot has a, like a lower risk. The later pilot who's like insanely experienced has a lower risk and it's that middle pilot for us. It was like 500 to 1500 hours. Because it's like, it's those, I got it. I got it all figured out. I know it. And they're the most risky because they'll make, they'll make high risk decisions and think they've, they've done it all and figured it out. Um, whereas the, the very seasoned pilot is like, I, I got nothing to prove. And mm-hmm. the entry level pilot is like, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm going back to the books and I'm, these are the rules. Like, I'm just going to follow them. And uh, they got like, you know, and their risk, their risk box is like a lot smaller. So um, yeah, I love that. In fact, it's funny you say that because I just did a simulator for um, one of the guys in runway who's starting to grow. And I basically, uh, he, I, I saw his scenario right now. He's starting to buy a lot of properties. And I, I, I intentionally gave him like three properties that if he didn't ask me where they were, like that his contractor wants to do all of them, but his contractor's only ever done one for him at a time. And then I, sp- so if, you, if, you're, if you're listening to this, it may be kind of hard to, to visualize, but I basically give a scenario of like, okay, you put three houses under contract and you're going out for bids on the third one. Your contractor says that they are going to, um, they want to run it and they gave you a great bid on it and they're doing two of your other projects right now. So questions like, have they ever done that many for me before? And then the one question I wanted him to ask me was, where is this third project? Because I put the third project like 30 miles away. And so like to really start thinking about the time that it's going to take this guy to get all over town during rush hour and different times. And can he manage all that, even though he's done one for them really, really well. And so if they took his bid versus, uh, you know, going out and getting three or four bids, I was going to have them lose money on that project and the project uh, the other two projects are working on right now. And the reason why I can create something like that is because I've done it like that happened to me. So exactly what oh, you're and I just went about. through it too. So if there's somebody that knows how to build it out, it's you because that exact scenario is what I'm going through right now. And I had to split it with my, my GC and I go, you've got all the San Antonio projects. I've got the Canyon Lake and New Braunfels project because those two are close proximity. The other two are close proximity, but otherwise I'm putting 350 miles a day on my car and I get nothing done. So yeah, yep. if there's anybody to be doing yep. this, you're, you're looking at them right here. Yeah. So it's cool to hear that like you can see value in it. So I, I think for, for a lot of people, and, and it helps me too, because now I'm like, man, um, you're in altitude, our altitude members, like I'm building out this simulation model and runway right now. And then i um, trying to figure out how to bring it to the business side of things, which, which I know how to do. It's just like capacity for me right now is, is building out the model, proving it. And I feel like the newer people need it the most, but honestly, like I think you guys should be watching these. I think you could watch it. I think you could see it, especially if we tagged them a certain way of like, hey, this is, uh, this is a flipper based and a more advanced uh, person who's probably moving up to altitude very soon where running through a scenario like that is interesting because anytime I've ever had somebody watch it, even the, the entry level, like you're raising money for a deal, there's something in there that you can, everybody can glean from it. So I think it's, a, I think it's powerful and important for us to, to probably bring everybody in that, that wants to come in. If people want to see it, they should. I wish that you saw that, um, I don't know, months ago. So, yeah. Um, all right. So uh, what I want to do now is just a quick transition. We, um, we talked a little bit about what Flip Hacking Live was like, a little bit about the simulation, the model that, that we've created and we're talking about there, uh, your presentation, some of the, the bullet points and value that you brought to the table. I heard amazing feedback from it. And there was all kinds of things at Flip Hacking Live. So what we're doing for you guys this year is we are actually doing a live replay of this and it's free. So you can just jump in for free, see a live replay and um, we'll... We'll obviously like structure it appropriately and basically give you an experience a lot like what Mike's talking about that the virtual group got um, behind the scenes. So like we'll we're gonna curate the different presentations. If it's something that only made sense October, November, December, January, you know, at the end of 2023, then it's coming out. If it was like real time information, we're not gonna waste your time. We're gonna make sure that we curate it to the best uh, way we can and the things that you're gonna need. So. I'm excited about that, and uh, and I'm pumped for you to be able to to attend this, especially if you couldn't travel then, if you couldn't afford it, if you didn't have the time, whatever it was. It was just you know, I had something double scheduled then, um, and now you have the opportunity to check it out, and I hope it helps you. And if it does help you, I think you're going to see the value of what we do, 
and, um, and what we offer. And if you're interested in, um, in applying to jump in the simulator with us and inside of our runway program, go to sevenfigurerunway.com, the number sevenfigurerunway.com, and you can do that. Um, Nathan, how can people get a hold of you if they want to um, reach out? I know they can listen to the last show um, with your phone number, but what is something that I can help you with at the end of the show? What do you need? Yeah, send in everybody to my Instagram. I've got a lot of new content up there. Um, I'm showing the projects that I'm doing. I've also just started kind of like a DIY series. I was just recording that the other day. So um, common issues that you run into as a flipper and then how I solve them, just because if I would have had that going into it, uh, there's a couple of YouTubers out there that I watched when I first got it started. So I went, man, if I can have that all on my pages, hey, updates on the projects that I'm doing, and then kind of some DIY stuff of this is what you do when you encounter these issues. Um, and then, you know, just 100% being honest, it's my main conduit for raising private money. So I've started to do some nice. videos for that as well. Um, that's the number one kind of pinch point in my business as well to get me the next step. Getting the 100% LTC was huge. It's helped me scale. Uh, the next step is really securing a lot more private money. I've got a couple on board right now, and that's been a, a game changer for me. So all that content on there, if you can see it, it's kind of proof of concept. You can see the projects that I do. So it's not just me getting on stage saying, hey, I do this. You can follow along and go, oh, he does do it. That's pretty cool. That's a cool project. And you can follow along. And I talk about that and the returns that my investors get on there too. Nice. What is that? What's the, what's the handle? Like it's at what? Handle is renovate with Nate. So it makes it kind of easy. Cool. Yeah. Okay. At renovate with Nate. So uh, go check it out on Instagram and then uh, grab your Flip Hacking Live 2023 recording if you don't have it already. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about what we do inside of the runway program, go to sevenfigurerunway.com. Uh, thanks for being here, Nathan. I appreciate thanks, it. Bill. And I'll see you guys on the next show. Bye.